Welcome to Paranormal Palace Radio, where truth equals reality, and truth is often stranger than fiction. Hello everyone, welcome to Paranormal Palace Radio, this is your host, Royce the Redneck Radio Man, and joining me tonight are of course my two co-hosts who have been graciously helping me out over the last several uh, weeks, uh, John Strubham and John Riggins, and also my guest tonight is going to be Mike Barra, who is a returning guest, and quite frankly, he's always a pleasure, he's uh, the co-author of I want to say it's either Dark Secrets or Dark Missions with, of NASA that was wrote with him and Richard Hoagland. And I keep getting the title of that particular book mixed up, so I'm going to get him to correct me on it here in a minute. But the ones I don't mix up is the ones that he's authored himself, The Choice. And also he's authored Ancient Aliens on the Moon and Ancient Aliens on Mars, which we'll be talking about tonight which I believe were his most recent books, and he tells me that Ancient Aliens on Mars is not out yet, but he can share a little bit about it. I'm not sure as to how much, and I believe that Ancient Aliens on the Moon is out, and I think it's going to be a very interesting evening. Uh, this is a man that has a lot of information to offer. Him and Hoagland have both done a ton of research work uh, about the uh, monuments on Mars and Crystal Cities. I think it is on Mars and the Moon or one or the other. And I, I haven't read it in a while, so I'm probably getting mixed up. So I'm going to let him correct me on any mistakes that I make. But right now, why don't we bring him into the conversation and get the ball on the road. So, Mike, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great, Royce. I was just sitting here watching myself on the Ancient Aliens Marathon all day long. There's nothing there's nothing that strokes your ego more than watching yourself on TV. <laughs> let me just tell you. <laughs> I really enjoyed watching that. Me and my son, Royce, watched all of those episodes both times around, and uh, you did. I thought you did excellent work in that one, but I'm afraid I may not have done such a uh, excellent job with the book uh, that you and uh, Hoagland were uh, co-authors on. Was yeah. that Dark Missions or Dark Secrets or? It, yeah, it is Dark Mission: The Secret History of NASA, and uh, that was a book Richard and I wrote in 2007. And then in uh, 2010, I wrote The Choice, which is about uh, you know using conscious thought to use the physics of the mind, the physics of uh, the real physics of the universe to, to change the outcome, to change the reality of the 2012 era that we're going to be in for the next, you know, probably 10 years still of change. And then uh, the new book is Ancient Aliens on the Moon. That's just out. And uh, coming up next year at the end of the year is um, Ancient Aliens on Mars. So and, uh, those are the four. And uh, one co-authored with Richard and uh, three on my own. And the others are your own books that are you've written by yourself, right? Yeah, I just you know Richard um, Richard just works a bit slowly, and I have things I want to say and things I want to get out, and I, I can just bang them out much quicker, you know, myself. It's not that I wouldn't love to have him uh, oh, co-author understand. with me, but uh, but you know, it's just it's it, it, he's he's a very deliberate writer. He's a very deliberate researcher. He takes he takes longer. <laughs> And I can stand, and I just every so often have things to say. Yeah. And I, you know, I realize there's an there's an ancient alien audience out there that's brand new, that uh, that doesn't know a lot of the stuff that was in Dark Mission and a lot of the stuff that came before in his book, like the Monuments of Mars. So, um, you know, I just thought it was important to um, to to write books that are shorter and less technical and more accessible to to a younger audience. So that's kind of where right. I've been focusing the last few years. Yeah, I, I do understand your position on that, and I do appreciate that. And I got to tell you, your books, I think they're really ideal and they're really unique. I mean, you got plenty of books out there about the uh, pyramids and other monuments here on Earth. And you do have the mm -hmm. books about monuments on Mars and even on the moon or cities on the moon and stuff. But you don't, mm -hmm. yours is the only one that connects the ancient aliens with these cities on the moon and Mars, in other words. So. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I mean that was you know that was my intent was to to get the ancient aliens audience to appreciate that there's a whole bunch of stuff not just on the Earth, which is what Ancient Aliens, the show, the TV show, focuses on, but also that there's there's you know ancient ruins um, all over the Moon and all over Mars, and I, I suspect pretty much all over the solar system, and you know that's really the de facto proof because you can argue all day long that men may have been able to build the pyramids or they somehow may have put together the stones of Pumapunku. You can argue that, but, you know, if you find one 
artificial pyramid on the moon or one giant glass tower on the moon or one sculptured face on Mars, the argument's pretty much over and the ancient alien theory is proven. So that's really the area that I'm the most interested in. Right. Now, also, one of the things I was going to be interested in getting around to, and, you know, I'm probably jumping the gun, is do you think there's any bases in use by uh, extraterrestrial beings on the moon or Mars, either one uh, today that we're just not aware of? We haven't got to that particular area of the planet yet or something? Well, I don't, I don't think it's that we haven't gotten to that particular area. I just think we, we you know, the, the photographs are doctored and they're just not taken of uh, certain areas. Like, yeah, I suspect that some of the bases are ours, some of the bases are, are ET, um, and I'm, I suspect that they're active. I mean, you know, the moon would be a perfect um, launching point. If you were doing reconnaissance of the planet Earth, if you were even, you know, coming all the way down and having direct contact with human beings, which has been alleged by a lot of the abduction authors and so forth, then, you know, the moon's the ideal place to, to have a base, a way station, and, you know, Mars would be like kind of a way station from wherever they came from. So all of these areas are definitely uh, possibilities, but I haven't, you know, it's hard to take a look at something. You can look at something and you can see that it's a, it's artificial, whether it's on the moon or on Mars, but, you know, most of the time they appear to be in ruins. They appear to be very old and not active, but, you know, you never know. Uh, there could be plenty of places in mm. Uh, there that are actors. Okay, and real quick, like Mike, before I forget, because I know me, I'll get wrapped up in conversation and this won't get out. Uh, they can get learn a lot more about you and your books and everything you got going on at your mm-hmm. website. Uh, I believe it's what, www.mikebarra.com or? Actually, no, that one, that one's uh, not active anymore. I, have, I now have a, a blog. It's, it's mikebarra.blogspot dot com. Okay. And uh no www. And you can just go to Google and type in my name and it's it's spelled B A R A. So just type in Mike Barra B A R A and my blog is probably the first link that comes up. First or second link and you can also find links to that on my Facebook page. Um I have an official author page there on Facebook too because I'm all loaded up with friends. Or uh, or even through my Twitter account you should be able to find. So so you know I'm pretty much all over the web. You can find me pretty easily. Uh, go to my YouTube channel, and uh, again, just type in my name, and uh, all that stuff comes up on Google, so it's not really a problem. Okay. Also, for those wanting to ask questions, the call-in number is 832-632-7904. And if you scroll below the chat room, you'll see a full description of him, as well as his books, as well as links to Amazon. Now, these won't be on this page tomorrow because I'm moving my next, next guest on here tomorrow. But I will be moving this page to the archives along with today's show and along with the same description and everything you need to know about him. So all you have to do is go over there and listen to it if you didn't catch it today. And uh, click on the books if you're interested or click on his website and you can get in touch with him. And, you know, please feel free to call in and ask any questions you may have. Um, Mike, I think a good place to start this off since I jumped the gun would probably be why don't you tell us a little something about the ancient aliens on the moon and what all you got covered inside of this book? Well, uh, this is a you know it's a new book that's covering essentially what I wanted wanted to do was to again bring the young audience up to speed on what people like Richard Hoagland and John Lear you know have been talking about for decades. Um, that's on the moon, basically you know obvious evidence of artificial structures, that kind of thing. So I wanted to bring people up to speed on that and also show them some things that we didn't get a chance to get into Dark Mission, for instance, um, and show them some newly discovered stuff. There's some really fascinating artificial structures on the far side of the moon, which, uh, which you know, I cover in the book, and uh, there's there's tons of pictures. And also, um, I to let you, want people know one other thing. If you do go to my, my blog, mikefarrow.blogspot.com, uh, there's a tab there that says photos, and if you click on that, there's a link to a web album where I have all of, all of the images from ancient aliens on the moon in, in high resolution because, you know, you lose a certain amount of quality when you go from from uh, high resolution uh, digital to print. It's just There's just no way you can't lose it. And I've heard a couple of people on Amazon have had reviews where they're complaining that, you know, it didn't, they couldn't really tell from the pictures what I was talking about. But you can certainly tell if you go to the go to the photo gallery and look up the stuff. Um, <clears throat> look up the stuff right there. So 
Um, basically, you know, it covers a lot of new things. It covers things that are on um, the back side of the moon. For instance, there's a, a pyramidal object um, that I call the Daedalus Ziggurat near the crater Daedalus. And there's a big controversy that's been going on back and forth between me and a guy who works for NASA about the, the veracity and reality of the image. And um, so that's kind of some interesting stuff. And there's some amazing things that people like uh, Alan Stern have found on uh, on the rim of the crater Copernicus, for instance. Uh, Copernicus, there's this whole vast complex of artificial stuff. There's places where the skin of the moon has been torn apart and you can see substructures. You can see what's obviously beams and girders and machinery in the shadows and buried inside this stuff. And it's really, really quite phenomenal and completely obvious. And so there's all kinds of interesting, cool stuff that hasn't been on the web before. Okay. Now, was that the moon that I believe I've read about at the Enterprise website that has a crystal city or the remnants of a crystal city? Uh, yeah, and, you know, what what we talk about in, in I think it's Chapter 4 of Dark Mission, is, is the crystal, what I call the crystal powers of the moon. And essentially what, what happened was that Richard Hogan discovered back in the mid-90s that uh, from enhancing images, that we've gotten not only from NASA scanning actual photographic negatives and prints and also getting stuff from Ken Johnson's personal collection of first generation prints. But if you enhanced or lightened up the background, what you could see is these towering, very geometric glass structures um, over the surface of the moon, sometimes going 20 to 30 miles high into the sky and having this very obvious sort of box-like kind of structures. And what I argue in this book is that those crystal towers of the moon are sort of a, um, a meteor shield because they would effectively act as if the moon had an atmosphere. So it would protect any bases down below from uh, meteor impacts. So, um, you know, this is one of the things that's kind of a, a controversial argument, but I think the evidence is overwhelmingly there that these large glass structures, these towering glass structures do exist on the, on the surface of the moon. And it's one of the things I cover pretty extensively in, uh, in ancient alien properties. So this is something that, uh, from the sounds of things, what you said earlier and what you're saying now, that evidently uh, NASA knows that ET is up there and they probably even, uh, they're working with them on some kind of project that we're not exactly privy to. Would that be the kind of the impression you're getting? Yeah, I think that they clearly knew this stuff was there, and they would have had to have known it because they would have had to be able to sort of navigate through, you know, the punch holes in this stuff. Because if you, it, the thing about glass, especially lunar glass, is that since there's no moisture on the moon, in a vacuum environment, it, it doesn't shatter the way terrestrial glass does. It's actually two two times stronger than steel. So essentially, what you're talking about is it would be, you know, at speed thousands of miles per hour. Um, if something as flimsy as a lunar module hits one of these glass structures, it would basically splatter like a bug on a windshield. So they had to, you know, have pretty well mapped and know where these areas were. Um, I talk about the case in the ancient aliens on the moon. I talk about the case of Surveyor 4, where it suddenly just ceased to exist while it was descending over Sinus Medici, the region in the middle of the moon, which is where Hoagland has always argued that there are these glass structures. And I think it just did exactly that. It was splat like a bug on a windshield, and that's, um, that's the reason why it disappeared. So, um, you know, it brings up kind of an interesting story, which is the story of Apollo 11. And if you remember when um, when they were descending to the moon, they always talk about it in all these shows, um, they had this, this uh, computer alarm that went off, and it was, a, it was a 1202 alarm, and there's always these very, you know, famous discussions where Buzz Aldrin talks about... Um, you know, the computer was overloaded with data, and it shut down and it gave us an error, and there was a while there where they weren't sure what the error was, and they were very, very close to simply abandoning the aborting the entire landing because they didn't know what the, what the computer was trying to tell them. Well, it turns out that the reason the computer was overloaded was because the lunar module had two different radars. It had a side-looking quote, rendezvous radar and a downward-looking descent radar. And on descent, Buzz Aldrin was only supposed to turn on one of them, which is the descent radar. And Now, if you buy the conventional NASA explanation that the moon is 
airless, that there's no towering glass structures, that there's nothing in the sky that you can't see above the mountaintops, the rounded, soft, rolling hills of the moon, then there's no reason for a, a side-looking rendezvous radar to be turned on. But Aldrin turned it on, and that's what overloaded the computer. And the reason he turned it on, I think, is because they weren't entirely positive whether they were going to run into some remnants of these giant collapsed glass structures that were up there, and he wanted to make sure that they didn't hit anything that they weren't supposed to uh, hit on the way down. And I think that's what that's definitely what overloaded the computer. And it's just really an interesting case where you put together all these little pieces, you know, statements the astronauts made, where they were when they made the statements, discussions like Apollo 11, Gene Cernan talking about, wow, we're really down among them now, and they're at 50,000 feet above the lunar, the lunar surface. Like, how could you be down among anything at 10 miles above the lunar surface, you know, because there's no 10-mile high mountains on the moon. Um, it just doesn't make any sense unless you put it together in the full context of there being these gigantic um, glass structures, which, as I said, I think are a meteor shield. So do you think maybe when they sent that um, bomb up there to the moon to supposedly check for water and they heard mm-hmm. a metallic ring that it was hitting something it wasn't supposed to. Yeah, and it basically just disappeared like a like a rock into a mud puddle. You know, it just basically disappeared. But when NASA, this is interesting because this is the very last two photographs in the book. When NASA actually released the image, they said that, that they were trying to get a plume of ice. They hoped it would, would be ice, you know, up into the sky that they would then be able to fly through with the other part of the Elcross spacecraft and take a spectral analysis and see if it was just dirt or if there was actually water ice there. But instead, the thing just disappeared, just went plop. And so NASA went on this kind of wild search to try to find um, if there had been some sort of plume and they had just missed it. They were very surprised by the results. And when they actually enlarged and and, and lightened up and enhanced the areas, what they found was a hole punched in the surface of the moon. And in the holes, you can see these very geometric, 90-degree angle, again, beams and girders sub underneath the surface of the moon, the substructure, an artificial substructure there is what it clearly shows. And, you know, so basically I think what happened was is that that, that so-called bombing, you know, part of the, the, the spacecraft actually just punched a hole through the very thin skin and ended up crashing into these abandoned old artificial structures. I mean, literally it looked like it looked like the, the Krell base in the underground Krell structures from the movie Forbidden Planet. That's what it looked like. And um, I think it probably surprised quite a few people at that. So it was, uh, yeah, I would think so. I was thinking a minute ago, <coughs> pardon me, uh, that it, for a minute it was sounding like perhaps there was like an underground city up there on the moon mm-hmm. or something like that. But uh, Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, that's, that's basically what happened is they crashed through a very thin sort of superficial structure and ended up kind of getting buried deep inside this, this massive um, underground base. So if that's the case, then do we really have a means of knowing if the whole complete satellite is natural or if it's uh, manufactured by ET in ancient times? Well, um, it um, the thing is that the samples that we brought back from the lunar surface do indicate that because of the um, the titanium isotopic ratios indicate that it is made from the same stuff as the Earth. In fact, it's made from the so-called light mantle material. And this is actually something I cover in Chapter 1 of Ancient Aliens on the Moon is where did it really come from? Is it completely artificial or is it partially natural? And and the most you know logical, uh, one of the arguments that's been made is that it was fishing away from the Earth at some point, that it basically spun off of the Earth um, and the, the theory is that it was done when we were in, when it was in sort of a solid state. I think it would spun off when we were still kind of in a molten state. And so that's why it's made from all the upper crust stuff, um, of the earth. And then I think what happened is, um, lots and lots of different people, for want of a better phrase, um, extraterrestrials, and I think possibly even a very advanced earlier version of the human race, went up there and started building stuff on top of it and, and building sort of a fake facade on the outside and constructing their bases, digging underground. I think it's a, a modified natural satellite to answer your question, um, you know, short way. 
Okay. That's probably not the only one that's up there. Uh, I gather from reading, uh, some of, uh, y'all's website, actually specifically from reading Richard's, I need to go more further in depth into yours on the, uh, you know, if you've done any work on the, uh, JFET, I think it was the name of the satellite, um, the Cassini took a picture of it, but it came out to be like a, a frozen, uh, Star Wars Death Star, didn't it? Oh, yeah, um, you're talking about Iapetus, which is the, uh, yeah, this is a, um, a moon with a view, Richard's article from a few years ago. Yeah, it's, it, basically, it's a gigantic dough decahedron is what it looks like. It, if you look at the horizon, instead of a curved horizon, it has a sharp, angled horizon, and it, it's, you know, it's completely different than any, any other satellite in the solar system, and uh, it, it very clearly shows signs, all kinds of signs of being an artificial satellite, and that is a completely different story, in my opinion, than the moon. Um, now, until we get more pictures of that, or we actually go there and visit and land and and look around a little bit, um, that one's going to be harder to confirm. And, and, you know, and again, I, I don't trust anything that comes out of NASA anymore, really. Um, I think that they, they digitally alter quite a bit of information to make sure that there's no smoking gun evidence of anything artificial. But that doesn't mean it's not really there. So, um, yeah, I have this is a fascinating uh, case, but I don't think it's our moon is like, I think it's a natural satellite that has been um, okay. modified, added to that kind of thing. So, in our moon's case, then, um, you have to ask yourself a question. What does NASA have going on with an extraterrestrial race that they don't want us to know about? And who else are they keeping this information from? I mean, are they sharing with the government? Are they sharing with the military? Or, you know, are they just keeping all the information all to themselves? Yeah, well, NASA is a, you know, division of the Department of Defense, and it says right in the, uh, the Congressional Act that created NASA, but anything that might be deemed, you know, worthy of national security interest um, gets reported to the Pentagon and the president, and they they have the final word on whether to put it, put it out or not. NASA has no freedom. Um, I'm sure they've discovered life on Mars. I'm sure they've discovered lots of artificial stuff, and they do not have the uh, right or the privilege to put that information out to the American people. They simply aren't allowed to do that. It's all through has to go through um, uh, the Department of Defense and the White House, and that was established very early on. Okay, so really when you go looking at secrecy, it's not all totally on NASA. They have a, another unit they have to answer to. But yet then, too, right. some, of, some of it probably rides on them, but not all of it. Right, and many of the most prominent NASA scientists, people like Dr. Stephen Squires, they all have DARPA security clearances and DARPA email addresses and defense and uh, advanced resources uh, um, projects. What's the name of the agency? I forget. But anyway, they're all they're all um, you know under the well, basically under the thumb of the defense intelligence agencies, and they work for them. And, and uh, I think even if they wanted to bring some of this information out, which I doubt that they do very seriously, but even if they wanted to, they really wouldn't be able to um, to put it out without the approval of their masters. And I just don't think that that's going to happen. Right. So. I, I'm not a, I'm, in other words, I'm not, a, I'm not a believer in the disclosure crowd. I think the disclosure crowd are just, just crazy. I don't think that's going to happen. They're kind of like dreamers? Yeah, um, I think it's really just Pollyannish, you know, it's, it's just not really something that's going to happen because you have, you have to understand if you put, start putting information like this out, what you're going to do is destabilize the political situation. And what president is at the top of the political mm-hmm. situation is going to, I mean, if he destabilizes things, the only place he has to go is down. You know, in other words, there's no, there's no ad, ad advantage to political leaders putting out the truth because about things like this, because if they did, the most likely result is that they will be removed from power or they will be held accountable or something bad will happen to them. So where's the motivation? There just really isn't any. I mean, why would anybody at NASA admit to having lied to the American people for 60 years? If it meant that they were going to go to jail, you know, which is a distinct possibility, they really wouldn't. So um, I just don't see how you create a situation unless there's some sort of um, major seismic shift in our way of thinking and uh, our way of dealing with this kind of thing. That I don't think there's any chance there's going to be any official disclosure. I think it's just going to be, you know, eventually sort of nudge, nudge, wink. Well, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, say no more. Everybody knows what's up there kind of thing. Would you care to venture a guess as to what kind of uh, collusion or partnership they might be having up there with ET? 
I don't have a clue. And, um, you know, I'm working on a new project where we may get maybe try to get to the bottom of that more. I really can't tell you about that, but I will be able to on the summer. But right now, um, all I can say is that, you know, I think that um, you hear these rumors that there are certain groups that are working with ETs and there are certain groups that are fighting the ETs and who are the good guys, who are the bad guys, who's wearing the white hats, who's wearing the black hats. I, I really don't know. It's very complicated stuff. Um, what I can tell you is that um, I do think that, that government is not, you know, people think of the government as one thing, but what really all these different agencies, they're, they're, they're corporations. They're actually set up as corporate entities. They're registered. They have Dunn and Bradstreet numbers, you know, because they have corporate credit rates, states do, governments do, agencies like the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy and, and, um, so forth. So they are really, it's a whole bunch of little fiefdoms that are sort of fighting over all this information and trying to find out the truth themselves. So in the end, it's going to all roll back down to money. Well, I don't know if it will roll back down to money, but I I think that they will not put out any information unless they're forced to. You know, I mean, I think if you had a situation like the French Revolution where it was the truth of the guillotine, you might start getting the truth out of some of these guys. Yeah. But, but, you know, and I mean, really, and, and this is what I talk about in my second book, In the Choice, there is so much intensity, so much change energy going on right now that we may end up there. I don't know. Uh, and I'm not necessarily advocating it, but, you know, there's definitely – um, a lot of conflict right now in, in, in our country. And, you know, who knows what kind of shifts. I, I do expect pretty big shifts in our monetary system and in our, our means of government over the next 10 years, especially. And, and who knows where we're going to end up. I really am not sure. Right. I'll be honest with you. If you ask me, the only way you'll ever get any kind of disclosure out of that is if one of these private sectors, uh, that's not affiliated with NASA in any way, Somebody really rich can afford to make their own trip to the moon or Mars, and they blow a whistle and bring back video and, pi- and pictures. Yeah, but I don't think that they would be allowed to make it there. I mean, I do. One of the things Richard uh, Hoagland talked about a lot is the idea of a secret space program, and I think that they've got very advanced spacecraft that are way beyond the commercial conventional stuff that we see in public. And I think if somebody went went to go to the moon or to Mars with the intent of you know, putting out the real stuff, I don't think that that probe or that spacecraft would ever make it back. So, you know, everybody, I think everybody's kind of in on the plan, and, and they all are convinced, I believe most of them are convinced, that they're doing it for the public good, that, that uh, you know, this would not be something that would be beneficial to the human race to know this stuff openly and, and uh, you know, honestly in front of the, the entire world, because we did a study called the Brookings Report back in the late 1950s, again, right after NASA came into creation, and it basically said, look, if you find artifacts, if you find exactly the kind of thing we're talking about, if you find evidence of ancient aliens on the moon, you probably shouldn't tell anybody about it, because if you do, it will drive them crazy. It will drive the world nuts. We will all go crazy, and society could collapse. Uh, Or actually, I think the word they use is disintegrated. So I think a lot of the cases in secrecy is based on this concept that, um, you know, it's the best thing for all of us to not know the truth. It's better for us to be kept in the dark for our own good. Okay. Well, be honest, I'm not exactly trusting like some people would be about as for our own good. Uh, I mean, even if it was, <clears throat> I've always had trouble with secrecy myself, and it seems to me like people that are so secretive usually ain't out for anybody's good but their own. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And you know, well, you're you're from Texas too, right? You know, you're a Texan, so of course, of course, you're not down with that. You know, you you live in the Republic of Texas, so why would you be? Now, on your book, you got um, pictures in both of them to, from your website or uh, that you've accumulated to give demonstrations mm-hmm. of what you're talking about, don't you? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, all the book, all the pictures that are in the book are on my in my Picasso web album, which again you can get through my my blog at mikeara.blogspot.com. So every single picture is there, um, and the same thing's going to happen with Ancient Aliens on Mars when that comes out. Uh, all the pictures are going to be put there in in full resolution, so everybody can see them, um, you know, in an even clearer fashion than they would be able to just from reading it in the book. So what? that's the idea: to make sure you got it in two or three different formats so everybody can see um, see what I'm talking about. Okay, well, I want to ask you this 